My guest this week is Catherine Yeski Taylor. Catherine is a longtime New Yorker, but she began her rock critic career in Atlanta in the 1990s, interviewing Georgia musical royalty such as the Indigo Girls, REM, and the Black Crows, all while she was still a teenager. Since then, she has conducted thousands of interviews with a wide range of artists for dozens of national, regional, and local magazines, including Billboard, Spin, and American Songwriter. She's also the author of She's a Badass, Women in Rock Shaping Feminism, and she's currently helping Eugene Hoots of Gogro Badello write his memoir, Rock the Hutzpa, Undestructible Ukrainian in the Free World. And it is my great pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Catherine Yeski Taylor. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. I wanted to ask you a few things. Sure. And one of the things I didn't know about you, because I've seen your name everywhere. I've read all these interviews you've done with amazing artists over the years. I had no idea that you started so young. Yes. 16. And you kind of were pushing back against the high school newspaper like, yeah, this sounds boring. I want to do this. Can you talk a bit about like what was driving you and if that was an easy experience to have? Well, I always loved music. I mean, I can't remember a time when I wasn't completely obsessed with music. And um, over the years, I picked up various instruments and I enjoyed like playing guitar. But it became clear that no matter how much I practiced, I was never going to be great at it. I just don't have that certain thing that you need to have that professional musicians going to have. Um, I don't think it can be taught. I think you have it or you don't. And um, but my whole life, I'd always been told by English teachers, you have a gift. You're really good at writing. So being a music journalist just seemed like the obvious choice for me because I could do writing that I'm actually good at and focus on something that I'm obsessed with anyway. So, yeah, when I was growing up in Atlanta, I um, signed on to work at my high school newspaper and they wanted me to cover really boring things. And I refused and said I wanted to interview musicians. And the faculty advisor just thought that was um, hilarious and said, you can try, uh, you know, thinking obviously right. that I was going to fail. But see, this is when Atlanta was really having a moment. You know, bands like Indigo Girls and Black Crows were, were really coming up and, and becoming huge. And um, so I would steal myself and call up their management companies <laughs> and say, hi, I want to interview them for my high school newspaper. And uh, a lot of times the managers would laugh at me too, but sometimes they would say, okay, because they, I guess, wanted to reward this over eager kid for having the guts to do that. I wouldn't say it was easy because, you know, there are clearly people who thought that I was deluded. Um, and it was terrifying to sit down with some of these people because I really didn't know what I was doing and I was so young, but they were all really nice to me. I don't remember anybody being disrespectful uh, at that point when I sat down with the artists themselves. It makes total sense though, because a high school audience is your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're the people spending money, going to the shows, turning their friends on to yeah. music and film and art. It's like, yeah, why wouldn't well, you? Well, yeah. And I mean, we were excited that these bands in our own backyard were suddenly doing so well. And so people right. wanted to hear about it. So, How did you find your voice? Did you find it pretty early or how long did it take you to do that? Um, it took a while. I, I went to journalism school at the University of Georgia, which is a really great journalism school. But um, I continued to try to write on the side. And so I got a, a, a column at Flagpole Magazine, which is a kind of an alternative oh, yeah. magazine in, in Athens, Georgia. And, um, and I wrote for them for a while. And that was good. But uh, you know, I was still kind of struggling to learn how to do this on the fly. And then I ended up convincing Tony Paris, who's an editor um, of some renown at a magazine called um, Creative Loafing in Atlanta to take me on. And, you know, it had taken me six months straight of calling him and bugging him to give me this opportunity. And then when I turned in my first article, he called me back and said, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And basically picked it apart. And I was crestfallen, you know, right. <laughs> getting my big break and, and being told that it really wasn't quite up to his standards. But then, you know, he took me under his wing and said, you know, I'm going to teach you how to do this the right way. And so he really helped me. And um, and he's the one who helped me find my writing voice. Do you have like pre-interview rituals that you have or things that you do that you just like, this is what I do before I talk to someone? 
Uh, I obsessively prepare. I probably take three times as long preparing as I actually talk to the person. Yeah. And yeah. So I, that's, I guess, I don't know if that's a ritual <laughs> per se, but yeah, well, if it's somebody I really uh, am personally a fan of, it's much harder right. to do this. And so I, I do have some like breathing exercises, like do not, you know, do not pass out because you're talking to someone. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's intimidating sometimes to yes. talk to people. Uh, you know, and I still get nervous, actually, before every interview to some degree, just because you don't know how it's going to go. And I'm sure you've realized this by now. Oh, yeah. You don't know when you get on the phone with somebody, no matter how well you've prepared as a journalist. Well, if they're having a bad day, it's going to be a bad interview. <laughs> and you just don't know. <laughs> yes, indeed. I think having the visual component at times for some of the interviews has made a big difference. I can see people's hearts warm, like people I was nervous to talk to, like Jerry Casali of Devo, who's just doesn't suffer fools, whip smart, very, you know, opinionated just to get smiles out of him. Like when I would like just kind of go the distance on things with them that weren't traditional. Yeah, I, I, it's it's kind of lovely when that happens. Yeah, there's always this moment where you click with somebody sometimes where you can you can tell that you've yeah. suddenly broken that ice. And sometimes it's the opposite. Like when I did the Peter Buck thing, he was really nervous. He was not <laughs> looking forward to getting in front of a live audience and doing it. And then he had a great time. But up to that moment we were going on, he was definitely pacing and buying drinks for people in the lobby. So I don't think it's easy for everyone to be the subject either. No, I don't think so either. I mean, like I'm on the other side of the, the call now. I have this <laughs> book out and I have to say, I really prefer being the one asking the questions. Sure. Because <laughs> well, sometimes just... people really throw you curveballs, you know? I mean, sometimes you can tell someone's trying to slip you up a little bit, you know, right. that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Well, I won't be like, why did you choose the color on the cover? <laughs> that really upset me. It, the, I love that the book is through the ages. I mean, you have... You know, Susie Quattro and Lydia Lunch in the same book, too, which mm -hmm. really once I saw who was in it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to speak to me on so many different levels. And, you know, there are newer artists that I wasn't as aware, aware of um, and people's experiences were so different. How did you decide to put the book together? Were these interviews specifically for this project? Yes, they were all brand new for this specifically. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, I got a call from a literary agent who said, I've been reading your articles and I think you'd be a good candidate to become an author. Have you ever thought of writing a book? And of course, like every journalist I have, that's kind of like the holy grail of sure. you know, being a journalist, um, but very few actually get to do it. So, you know, I I said, yeah, I'd be interested, but I didn't really have too high hopes. And um, I never really had given much thought of like, oh, I desperately want to write a book about this, you know? So he and I uh, just kind of spitballed ideas back and forth. And then he said, I, I recently read an interview you did with Danita Sparks of L7, and it was yes. really good. Why don't you write a book about women in rock and feminism? And as soon as you said that, I said, that's it. That's the one. That's what I need to do. Because over the decades, you know, there have been a lot of interviews I've done with female artists where they've told me you know, stories of what it's like to be in such a male dominated business. And sometimes it's infuriating and sometimes it can be hilariously funny because people can be really clueless when they deal with women sometimes. Yeah. And so I, I immediately knew I would have enough material to do it. So it was just a question of figuring out who to get for it at that point. And um, uh, I did a book proposal and, and it ended up selling to Backbeat, who's a great publisher. And um, they basically let me do what I wanted in terms of getting the various women for it. Like they didn't tell me, you must get these people. Um, of course, now everyone's like, well, why don't you include my favorite artists? You know, okay. <laughs> there's only so much space. You know, I had 20 <laughs> chapters and I could only do so much. So I, I did my best to uh, to get women across the decades. I start with Susie Quattro in the early 70s because she really was the first uh, female rock star who led her own band, played her own instrument, wrote her own songs. Right. Um, yes, I know Janis Joplin came before her and Grace Slick, but. You know, they didn't lead their own bands and write their own songs per se, you know. 
Um, so Susie really was a trailblazer. And then I wanted to go up through today. And, and so the book is ordered from oldest to youngest so that people can see how things have changed or not in some cases um, in terms of women's experiences. Yeah, it's amazing how different the experiences were. Um, the, you know, especially it seemed like more of the, the younger artists are, are really facing it. Yeah, I was a little disappointed to discover that. Yeah, like, um, you know, Bonnie Bloomgarden from Death Valley Girls saying when we show up, every club we show up, they look at us like we don't know what to do with our amps or we don't even know what a microphone is. And then by the end of the night, they're like, good job. And buying the shots like and they're like, this is my job. I know what to do. I'm a professional. I heard that story over and over again. I just I, I chose to put in her example. But I mean, like that story I've heard a lot over the years. You spoke of Danita Sparks earlier. There's a great quote in the book where she said, I had guys at record companies play me current hits and say, would you guys maybe try to sound like this? And I'm like, would you guys say this to Neil Young? And it's just like, it's L7, right? You know, you signed them, you know what you're going to get. Like, it's just that the industry is still pushing to change people and be so chauvinistic and sexist. Did you find that in the journalism world as well? I, I did. Um, I think that is getting a lot better because I talked to young women who are starting out now and, you know, their experience seems very different from mine. Um, in the introduction to this book, I do talk about my experience um, starting off and how I, I did encounter some appalling treatment because of my gender. Um, you know, I would be the only female on staff in some cases. Uh, and the older male writers just clearly didn't think I knew what I was doing and were very condescending. I had someone once suggest that I was only getting cover stories for a magazine because I had an inappropriate relationship with the editor. Um, I had uh, a writer ask me if I wrote my own articles or if someone wrote them for oh, wow. me because he didn't think that apparently I could do it myself. You know, some of this, I think, might be chalked up to the fact that I was very young when I started, as we mentioned. But then I think of someone like Cameron Crowe, who's very celebrated totally. for starting off at about that same age. And I really do think that if I had been a young man in that same position, I would have received very different treatment in some cases. But, uh, you know, on the flip side, I'm interested uh, in all the women in the book. There is a significant contingent who like don't want to be called feminist, who don't want any of these labels applied to them. And so that was really fascinating too, you know, to have women who basically said, you know, don't even label me that at all. So right. it was interesting to hear about the different ways that women have approached combating this situation. So did you feel like that was a bit generational in the book? To a certain degree, there were somewhat older artists who said, I don't want that label associated with me because they would think of the, the things that happened in the 70s and they right. felt that maybe it was too strident or man hating and they didn't want to be associated with that. The younger women who would say that kind of thing, I felt it was more because um, they just simply feel that this shouldn't even be necessary at this point to call yourself a feminist. You just are doing what you're doing. And that's enough. Yeah, that's yeah, that's incredible. The book is amazing. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, I am so thrilled this film is finally coming up and that you picked it. Purple Rain. People have been asking, when is Purple Rain coming out? When is Purple Rain coming out? I was like, it's coming. It's coming. I got to wait. Did you see the film? When it came out, were you a Prince fan? What came first, Purple Rain or your knowledge of his music? Um, my knowledge of his music, just because uh, listening to the radio, I knew who he was, of course. I mean, um, he had had hits before this film, of course, with Little Red Corvette. Um, you know, yeah. he was kind of everywhere. All, yeah, exactly. So I knew who he was. I was too young to get to see it in the theater because it had an R rating um, and oh, yes. I wasn't there yet. Yes. Um, but I, I remember as soon as it was available on uh, VHS tape um my mother rented it for me and some of my friends who were having a slumber party and um i don't think she really knew what was in it because <laughs> some of it being pretty inappropriate for girls who were you know 11 12 years old yes but I you know uh we rolled with it i don't remember it traumatizing us if anything i remember us being kind of fascinating or kind of re rewinding part of it and going what is going on here kind of yes. thing. 
Um, but, but I remember more than anything being just feeling electrified by the live performance segments in this because, you know, as a kid, I hadn't yet, of course, gone into nightclubs and seen this kind of thing for myself. And I think this film is one of those uh, films, one of those rare films that really captures what it feels like to be in a nightclub when there's a really great band playing. It's amazing that they got access to the First Avenue legendary yeah. Minneapolis club that also had the uh, Seventh Street Entry, which was a smaller club where like Husker Du and replacements kind of broke and stuff like that. But it, the, the theater that's still there, the larger venue and the smaller one, I, I pulled up what was happening during the time they were filming this. This is October 1983. This is a typical calendar month. So the time who are in the film are playing Love Tractor, Flesh Tones, Tower of Power, True West, Richard Thompson, Chris Stamey, Swans. This is an amazing bill. It says X with Howard DeVoto and also appearing The Replacements, Ray Charles, Shockabilly, The Bongos playing with Mental as Anything, the three o'clock, and then maybe the best one of all, Jonathan Richmond with Fab Five Freddy. Wow. And the Church of the Subgenius as one show. That is just an amazing roster. Right I know. There. <laughs> and you just realize, yeah, Minneapolis was like a beacon. But and it just also shows where music was at that time. You know, you had the American Underground coming up, you had the UK and in, uh independent scene kind of influencing things, and you had, you know, soul music and you know, R&B and pop, all these things playing in the same venue. And I think it's brilliant that, you know, they chose to shoot it in a place that Prince and the time were really comfortable in. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people think that that venue um, has far outlasted most music venues because of this film. But I think, I mean, as the list you just read demonstrates, they already had their finger on the pulse. That's why they have this longevity because they really know what they're doing there yeah. in terms of getting in the right people. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, seeing the film, I was kind of dragged to it by some friends because to me, I was at that age where I was just like, I'm already sick of Prince. It's everywhere. I've heard this song a million times. It's driving me crazy. And I'd seen the videos. I didn't know what he was like as a live performer, um, except for, you know, in performative you know, uh, stylized videos. But I just remember the feeling of seeing that film in a theater and just how people were just set to vibrate. Like they were so excited. Yeah, it was like extended performances. At the beginning, you have 11 minutes of straight music with four consecutive songs. And then at the end, you have 20 minutes. And so that leaves like less than an hour for the narrative stuff. So it's jam packed with music. Yeah, they're smart because that was his strong suit, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you saw it when you were young and mm -hmm. did you get the soundtrack immediately? Were you like obsessed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had the soundtrack. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah everybody And did. most of the people I knew kind of. That was the time when it was like the trifecta it was like Prince, Madonna and Michael Jackson. And everybody had those three things like everybody. <laughs> the story of this film getting made is also very fascinating because Prince, you know, at Warner Brothers, you know, he was so young, got a three album deal with just complete control over it artistically. Which is amazing. He could negotiate that, by the way. <laughs> I know. And then he does things also like, well, I'm not going to talk to the press for two years once this film comes out and I'm on tour. But I also didn't know that this was not the first film that was going to be made he originally was going to make a film in 1982 called the second coming with chuck statler who'd done like the cars and devo and he even did a time video but i guess they started shooting it and prince was just too demanding and chuck <laughs> and him split so it, it is also this film has prince's fingerprints all over it uh he was constantly helping rewrite I don't even know where to begin with the film. Like, okay, well, let's start with the, the beginning of the film. Let's go crazy, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, again, it, it was a rare instance of a, of a film being shot like a music video by that point. Yeah, because you have to remember at that point, MTV was barely a thing. Like, I think it had been out for less than... I think MTV had been on the air for maybe less than two years at that point. Right. Like, it was not even... a Like, so even music videos, short-form music videos were still kind of a novelty for people, let alone something like this. 
Yeah, it's amazing to go back. I've been watching a lot of Night Flight lately. Oh, Night Flight. <laughs> yeah, they're playing all this stuff right now. And you're, everyone is jamming a movie into three and a half minutes. It is like they can't help themselves. And they're so awe-inspiring because they, they throw everything in, right? They're just like, it's going to be a science fiction film for three and a half minutes if it's a Duran Duran thing. Okay, now it's going to be an espionage thing for three and a half minutes. Now it's going to be a, a, a story of Huey Lewis, you know, getting his heart broken on the beach for three and a half minutes. <laughs> um, so I remember being won over by the film, basically, when I saw it. And this first song was really a brilliant way to just not be like, oh, Prince is acting in this or, you know, we're getting into the drama. It's just basically an extended music video, live performance video. The other thing, they wanted this opening sequence with all the cuts to the other characters and players in the film. It was a nod to the Godfather for the baptism scene where everything's going on. They were like, we want you to get to know all these characters right away. Yeah. Instead of you just seeing them on stage. That's a really clever way of them to do it. Because, I mean, you know, it's not bogged down with all this, <laughs> all these details about people. I mean, you immediately know who Apollonia is, you know, arriving in town $35 taxi ride. Yeah. And, in, you know, kind of flying by the seat of her pants, you immediately know who Morris Day is, you know, and how he's reacting to, you know, the rivalry between his band and, and Prince and the Revolution. I mean, it's, 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 it's so quickly set up that like you immediately know within the first 10 minutes, the whole premise of this film, basically, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. You know, a Jerome and Morris are just like, we're going to kill him. Who are my favorite part of the film, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I love those guys. You know, I, I believe that Morris Day got a massive contract after this film. And also it was weird. Prince, it, it was so weird. He seemed to celebrate the people he worked with, but also really liked to, had trouble with it. Like he'd bring the time on tour with them and then would kind of kick him off some dates when they'd hear that the time were kind of blowing Prince off the stage. And I guess kind of that through line of Wendy and Lisa writing that song and Prince not being interested was closer to the truth than not um, in terms of his working relationship with people. Yeah, that's yeah, it's interesting. And it's also interesting, um, you know, he even put some of his like the woman he dated in the like Jill Jones, who yep. plays the waitress. You know, he was dating her, but he was also kind of pitting her against other women he was dating, you know, so he seems to do that. Uh in this film too, where he's kind of setting up these little dramas with people. It's, it's interesting. I don't, I can't think of anyone else who actually operates that way uh, since or now. <laughs> Absolutely. And he also put Jill in two of his other films, you know, like under the cherry moon. So he has loyalty. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's really strange when you try to put the pieces together. If you don't know the Minneapolis scene or know much about Prince, um, like when I went to see it, you know, I didn't know if this was really his band or if they were actors. You know, I was not mm -hmm. that aware. And, you know, Prince pretty much. I mean, like, what do you think of Prince as an actor? Uh, I think he's a mediocre actor, to be honest. I think, uh, you know, it, it just isn't what he does. He's a musician, clearly, through and through. Right. Um, you know, the acting in this really... You know, it's obvious that these, for the most part, are not professional actors. I mean, most of them were musicians who took a few acting lessons so that they could do this film specifically. Um, and that's kind of obvious throughout much of this. Um, but that's kind of an endearing quality to it also. You know, like we all have those films where, you know, sometimes the dialogue is so clunky that it's kind of funny, even though it wasn't intended to be. It kind of adds to the appeal in some ways. Yeah, it's definitely... There's no mistaking it in terms of the script and the style and the look of it. You know, it's it's a really it's one of those crazy 80s films like you watch something like Cocktail or Roadhouse and you're like, what? This is not based in reality. You know, this club seems to be a venue where bands play one song and leave the stage and then another <laughs> band comes on and plays one song and leaves the stage. And you're like, what world is this? And they're competing each against each other for stage time. And, but it's, yeah, you can't really figure out like the hierarchy and what this club is. 
Yeah, I remember this really confusing me, actually, because I, I, like I said, I hadn't really been in clubs yet. Right. So, you know, I was 12 or 13 or whatever. Um, when I really kind of when this sunk in about how this was working in this club and thinking that's how it worked is that every club has two or three bands that they hire and those bands just kind of continue to play constantly. It, you know, it. I didn't know better that that's actually not how it works in, in most clubs. And right. like, you know, there's kind of like the, whatever the, the Las Vegas lounge thing. Yes where they'll have like a house band and they constantly play and might have like two or three bands that kind of cycle in and out like that. But I mean, that's, this is not how clubs operate. This is not how clubs in the rock world have ever operated anywhere to my knowledge. You yeah. Know? Like maybe some band could be good enough that they could play uh, once a month or maybe twice a month if they're really having a moment on a Friday night. But like, I don't know of any instance actually where I can think of a club that operated the way this film makes it seem where they have three bands and that's all that ever plays there. And they have to pit them against each other yes. to see if they're going to continue to be those three bands who always get on the bill. It's very strange. Yeah. I mean, Cause there <laughs> is a competitive nature in music, um, you know, bands, it's just not written, you know, uh, but it is, there is a sense of like, you know, wanting to, um, put on a great show and kind of blow people away and all that. But it is, it is so funny in this film that it is, um, it is a, a full on competition. It's do or die. Yeah. Like you are going to be kicked out into the cold if you don't move up the ranks and who is right. at the top, who's in the middle. Yeah. And I, it's kind of a great, it works really well as a absurd plot point. Yeah, it does. I mean, like, it's just funny, though, because, you know, in the real world, if fans kind of got in a situation where there wasn't enough room for both of them to play enough at a particular club, they'll just go play at another club, you know? Like, it's... <laughs> yeah. If you're Prince, I don't think you're going to have trouble if you're the time. <laughs> yeah. The, the director of the film had an amazing summary of it, and I wanted to see if you feel like it did it justice. This was his little log line, but it was... His description was Prince is a powerful magnetic force in the world of his peers who becomes humiliated, frightened, damaged when he sets foot in the home he shares with his parents. But by the end of the film, he has learned to let others into his world. He has learned to love. Do you think that's a good description of this film from the director? Uh, I guess that's a good description of the film's plot B, you know, yeah. the secondary plot, you know, the the love story with Apollonia and his relationship with his parents. But that kind of really overlooks what we've been saying is the best part of the film, which is all the performative aspects of it. And not just his, but the time also puts in some really phenomenal performances in this also. And I think that shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, I know Prince is the the clear star of this, but um, there are some other people who really shine in this as well. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's also funny. At one point, the club owner says to Prince, the stage is no place for your personal shit. And I'm like, it seems to be and it seems to be working pretty well for everyone. <laughs> and I think it, the stage is exactly where your personal shit goes. You know, it's like you got to bring it up there, you know? Yeah. Every artist I know pretty much yeah. <laughs> uses their personal life as fuel for their songs. So that doesn't actually make sense. Yeah. But. And also his performances <laughs> are really intense when he's having these kind of meltdowns on stage. You're like, I would be like, I can't believe what I just saw. You know, if, if you know, I went to see, you know, Paul McCartney have a meltdown at his piano <laughs> and like you knew something was going on and he was feeling it. I'd be like, yeah, OK, tonight's different. I'm trying to think if I've ever known anybody to have a performance like these in this film where they basically have a meltdown. Um, and I can't think of any. Can you? I have seen. I I found out about things after the fact, you know, like I I went to see Deer Hunter once. And I thought it was an amazing show. And then I talked to one of the members afterwards and they're like, oh, you weren't here. Like when the doors opened, I said, no, he said, we were still sound checking and it was really uncomfortable. We we were told not to leave the stage. We had to keep doing this stuff and people were just kind of watching us. And so I was bummed out all night playing. Right. 
he was like, it was, we were all miserable because we were, it just was uncomfortable. Um, but then I was like, that was an amazing show. And they're like, no, it, it was sucked. You know? <laughs> oh, so, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like I've heard things like that where you talk to the people afterwards and they kind of let you into something you didn't see. And I definitely saw bands that you were like, oh, this band is going to break up, right? This is, you know, like the first time I met Dinosaur, when they were still Dinosaur, they were talking to each other. They were standing next to each other, Jay and Lou afterwards. You could go up and talk to them and they were very conversation oriented. And a year later when I saw them, it was like, they were yelling at each other 12 seconds in, you know? And you're like, whoa, yeah. like this is the same. They hate each other. So, but, so I've, I've well, and also, I'm sorry, I, I have. I went and saw Lou Barlow play and people were heckling him saying, where's Jay, where's Jay? Mm. And he was doing this acoustic show and he was like, I think if you'd shut up and listen, I think you'd really like this. And then he went, up he took his guitar off and he went up to the heckler and grabbed him by the hair and then kicked him in the chest while grabbing his hair and continued to wow. sing down to this guy and then left the stage and then came back and did an encore after the guy came back and apologized for being a dick wow it was it was like wow <laughs> that's this, very dramatic yeah it was really like it, but you could feel that something was going to break. And um, so I've seen it in smaller ways. <laughs> I mean, Lou Barlow is not Prince. But, you know, um, it's hard to tour and it's hard to you just don't know what people are going through. So yeah. but in this film, we are very aware of Prince's home life and stuff. But what, what do you think about the storyline with his family and, you know, all the 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 abuse with his father to his mother and stuff like that. Do you feel like that's effective? I thought it was, um, yes and no. I thought it was really interesting, um, that he chose to portray his home life as being so, uh, damaged in that way. I thought it made him seem very vulnerable and that was just really not what I was expecting from a musician of his stature, you know, I guess I I would think that most musicians, you know, you get your chance to do your star vehicle film, you're going to make yourself seem like some kind of Superman. And he really doesn't do that in this, you know, he makes it very clear that, yeah, on stage, he's, you know, got his act together. He, he can really dominate the audience, you know, be a great performer. Um, but at home, it's kind of a disaster. And I thought that that was really fascinating that he chose to kind of make that the big conflict in this film, like how he and his family are, are grappling with that, um, because it just made him seem very flawed in many ways, too, when later in the film, he starts seeming like maybe he's going to go down the same road as, as his father and become abusive. I, I remember about 10 years, it was exactly 10 years ago, because it was uh, when this film was celebrating its 30th anniversary, um, they were having it in theaters. And I thought, well, now is finally my chance to see it on the big screen. And it was packed. And it got to that scene where he almost hits Apollonia and the audience just wasn't having it. Like people gasped and they were horrified like it really did not play to modern audiences at all yes you know and uh i thought it was really interesting because you could tell that that really lowered a lot of people's opinion of him like instantly like i went with someone who'd never seen the film at all and she's just like screw him like i don't want to know anything about him now you know it was really interesting you know, that he would choose, I guess, to portray himself in a way that is so unlikable and so flawed and in many ways so vulnerable. So I thought that was really interesting that he used his family life as as the device to get that across. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's so interesting seeing this film in a movie theater in the 80s. I, you know, I went with, uh, you know, all my my friends were all female and we went together and no one batted an eye. No one was like, oh, 
can you believe that Prince? It was just part of like 80s film storytelling. Right. I mean, if you look at a lot of early 80s videos, there's a lot of treating women pretty badly. I mean, like this yeah. is this is what I have a hard time explaining to the young women who I talk to now who are musicians or journalists. You know, that's partly why I wrote this book is that I want people to know, you know, the way things are now is it, it still has some problems, but it's not nearly what it used to be. And and even back then, you know, because the, the comeback is always, well, why don't you just do something about it? Why don't you just complain? You know, well, you could try that, but no one would care. Like it it wasn't a thing. Like if if someone complained that someone had manhandled her, everyone would just shrug and say, well, too bad. You know, that's just the way it was. Yeah, it's very normalized in this film um, in terms of like a dramatic device of him, you know, um, falling in his father's violent footsteps. But yeah, it it was amazing watching it. Um, I probably saw it five years ago for the first time since seeing it, you know, since I was a teenager and just being like, this is a completely different film than I remember. All I remembered was like the performances and the stuff with the time. And then like, like every 10 minutes, there's something you're like, oh, that is problematic. Yeah, there's a lot that's problematic in this in terms of the way women are treated. You know, the the whole thing with Apollonia and the lake, oh my God. Um, yeah. you know, the, the band that Morris puts together with her and Jill and others, you know, is pretty problematic in terms of just sexualizing these women and instead of putting their talent first, you know, there, there's a lot in this film that's that does not hold up by modern feminist standards at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. And it's again, you know, the lake scene you're talking about. It's just like in the 80s, you're like, oh, he's so impish. She comes back, she kisses him on the cheek and they ride off in the motorcycle. Everything's mm -hmm. forgotten. Right. I remember, you know, like watching that with my friends at that slumber party. And we thought that scene was hilarious. You right. know, it didn't. It didn't even occur to us that he had basically manipulated her into doing something really inappropriate. It's also interesting because, you know, his albums were, you know, so sexual. And you have a film that has a lot of sexism in it, but also is just, you know, has a lot of sexuality in it in terms of, like you said, how they're presenting Apollonia's band and, you know, the love scenes in it and the, the dumpster scene and things like that. But like. Do you see a distinction between his records? Do they hold up in the same way in terms of the sexuality that that is, you know, omnipresent on his records? I think the records hold up better um, because in those the insinuation that this is all consensual. I mean, it's never really spelled out, but I mean, like you don't get the feeling that he's manipulating anyone in these songs, um, whereas in the film, you know, a lot of things happen to women like the infamous dumpster scene you just referred to. A woman came up saying something to Morris he didn't like, so he had his sidekick literally pick her up and throw her in a dumpster. You know, she, she was powerless to do anything about that because he was much bigger than her, you know, that kind of thing. You know, all the examples in the film like that where women are having these things happen to them and there's not really much they can do about it in, in that moment. So I think his songs come across better because at least in those you get the sense that it's a it's a more even playing field in the relationship. He was like the first artist to have like a number one film, a number one single, a number one LP. He, you know, was an independent artist in a lot of ways in terms of like how he made his art. So it's 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 fascinating that it's still I feel like there's a split in the audience now. There's people who've written yeah. the film off and there are people who are like, no, the film's great. You gotta get past that. Well, I'm torn in myself because, you know, all these things that we just said, but then also in other ways, I mean, he's a champion for women in many ways at a time when people weren't, when men weren't, you know, um, having Wendy and Lisa in his band and making them such prominent members of his band and making it clear that he viewed them as his peers. Well, that really wasn't done very much at that point. You know, there were examples of that, you know, Fleetwood Mac comes to mind, Um but there really weren't very many examples of bands where the women were given such status within the band 
um, rather than just kind of like we have her up here as like eye candy kind of thing. Or, you know, someone else has written these songs and decided what she's going to look like. And she's just kind of up there singing. You know, he really gave them um, a lot of power within his band. And that was really unusual. And then similarly, uh, working with Susan Rogers, who is the recording engineer who worked with him throughout this time period and became his in-house recording engineer at Paisley Park, his complex in, in Minneapolis where he recorded. And you know, at that time, she, she was really unusual for being a female recording engineer. In fact, it's still unusual for a woman to be a recording engineer. So he really in some ways was very much a champion of women in, in very significant ways too. So yeah, I'm really kind of torn down the middle because sometimes like I, I don't really like what he's done toward women. And then in other ways I really applaud it. So it just depends on the situation that we're talking about. But yeah, I find it interesting that in the film, Wendy and Lisa are, they're trying to just show their worth in it. And he is written as a character who's like, doesn't have time for it. Leave me alone. And at the end, he's like, they're the, you know, he's like, I'm going to do their song. This is not a Prince song. This is their song that I'm going to do. And it's Purple Rain. And, you know, as a thematic device. Yeah. It's interesting because, I mean, they didn't write that. He wrote that song entirely right. himself. So it's interesting that even in this film, he was willing to give them that credit. I don't know, though. In, in that case, I'm not sure that I view that particular aspect of it as being sexist. Um, I view it more as he is clearly the leader of that band. And so he was the primary songwriter. And I don't know that he was going to give any of the other band members that space. Right. If that makes sense. Like if Bobby Z, the, the drummer came forward with the song, I don't think he would have wanted to hear it either at that point. You know, I, I'm not sure right. that he was dismissing their work um, because they were women. I think right. he was just kind of saying, I'm the leader here. I write the songs. Yeah, you're right. You want to write songs, go start your own band kind of thing. So I'm not sure that I can really lump that part in so much with the sexism. But yeah. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that he used that as a plot point in terms of like, oh, I didn't write this. You did. I'm going to give you the credit. I had no idea till recently that that Purple Rain was originally going to be a duet with Stevie Nicks, mm -hmm. a country ballad. Thank God that didn't happen. And I love Stevie Nicks, but my God, that sounds atrocious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she just was a little overwhelmed by it and said, no, no, this isn't right. And then once they figured it out, I guess they would play it for hours as a band trying to figure it out. Like Prince's work ethic in this film and production wise is pretty intense as you would imagine yeah well that's one thing that strikes strikes me really in this film that i don't really see people talk about it um but one thing that always made a big impression on me is how hard all of the characters in this film work yeah you know i mean they all are workaholics like prince and the revolution morris day in the time all the people working in the club apollonia like all everyone in this film um i think except for his parents which we don't really know what they do um, outside of fighting. Um, but everyone else in this film works really hard to get somewhere. And and I think that's a really interesting message because uh, isn't that kind of the, the, the stereotype of musicians? Like, oh, become a musician because then you'll have this carefree existence. You, it's not really working then. Well, this film makes it clear just how hard musicians do work if they're going to get somewhere. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing, actually. Well, let's talk about the soundtrack album. Let's talk about the music. When Doves Cry is in this movie and such an unusual song. No bass. No bass. And that was kind of a last minute choice. There was a bass part originally. But I just remember that sound at the beginning of the song. That <laughs> just being like, this is, a pop this is how you decide to start a pop song. I was always really excited anytime something in the pop world had something that was a little dissonant or strange. I, th I just remember my ear just picking up on that and just how unusual that song was. I didn't even realize there was no bass in it at the time. Yeah. It just sounded different. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he really pioneered a sound. I mean, the Minneapolis sound is a thing, you know, and uh you know it the instant you hear it, the, the unusual percussive sounds he used. Um, 
all these things were really revolutionary in in their way and the moment his songs came on the radio you knew exactly who it was even if you'd never heard that song before and that's a really difficult thing for any musician to achieve in any genre at any time yeah because you're right it just being able to within a few seconds be like oh i think this might be prince and then you're like yep it's very unusual <laughs> to be is. able to do that yeah yeah, and it had industrial elements, and it just, again, a very weird, unlikely song. I mean, obviously, at the same time, it had nowhere to go but to to the top because it was just so brilliant. But, they, you know, there's also uh, Computer Blue and Darling Nikki and I Would Die For You. Um, it's just full of hits. Yeah, there's not a bad song on this album. No. what would What's your favorite? Uh, the Beautiful Ones. I love that one. I really love that one. I love Let's Go Crazy and I Would Die For You for some reason. Yeah, I, there isn't a song on here I don't like. Yeah, <laughs> Right. There isn't one that I skip over when I put this album on. The other thing that I'd forgotten about, and I, she, it just shows uh, like where my mind was as a teenager, was at the end, I forgot that he climbs up onto the PA and then touches his guitar and then sprays the audience with you know ejaculate from his guitar and then turns around and looks dead in the camera and freeze frame yeah end of film i was like why was this not the talking point when i was a teenager like did you see that because i completely forgotten about it i think they just didn't know how the hell to end this film i mean really i mean it's you know i mean like you can't have it with him leaving the stage in any way because that would be a letdown right like you got to end on that right. high so he's got to still be on stage when the film ends well how do you end it you can't end in the middle of the song i mean i think they just didn't know what to do well i'm also a sucker from my video store days of I loved films that would end on a freeze frame for some reason. It just it's a always very 80s thing. <laughs> yes, totally. And you're just like, yeah, imagine like five easy pieces if like Jack Nicholson turns around before he gets on the truck and just looks and it freezes. <laughs> you're like, OK, that's a different film than this. But yeah, I just had forgotten about it. Yeah, they did that a lot in the 80s. <laughs> now that you say that, it's true. <laughs> and a lot of just music videos ended that way as well. Yes, yes. But I forgot that it was so sexual. It was so funny because, you know, you, watching it again, you're like, oh, yeah, I would die for you. He's just like rubbing himself for like minutes while the camera is just rolling around him. Um, he's just on fire. But yeah, that, that sequence at the end where it's the trilogy of the songs, you know, Purple Rain, I Would Die For You and Baby, I'm a Star is also kind of a killer way to end the film because it's just like it's like we're done with the story. Here's what you kind of came for, because I, I love Sign of the Times. I'm I'm kind of a fan of that movie um, just because it's it's, again, very theatrical, not realistic in terms how a stage show would be the way they blend backstage stuff and and storytelling elements in it with a, um, a stage set. I mean, I did think like you that maybe I would see a lot more things stylistically than I did. It's kind of a letdown, honestly. I was like, oh, wow. I was led to believe it was going to be something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what was the first show you ended up getting to see? Um, in terms of like just regular concert? Yeah. yeah. Um, my first concert that I remember going to see and like paying money to see, you know, rather than something my parents like took me to see. Mm. Uh, was White Snake. <laughs> oh wow! How was that? Oh, uh, I was thrilled. A great white opening, and they were good. I, I thought it was great. Uh -huh. It was when they were at their peak, and I I wanted to be Tawny Katane very badly, and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So yeah, it was a great experience. And years later, I I did interview David Coverdale and told him about this experience, and he was very gracious about it. Even though you know I've had mixed experiences with telling people that I saw them play when I was a kid because some people react kind of badly to that because, you know, I think it makes them feel very old. <laughs> but but he he was he was uh, he was really lovely about it. You know, he's like, oh, where was that? And when was that? You know, he was he was good about it. <laughs> but yeah, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I, let's see the first nightclub show that I went to see. Um, I can't remember specifically when that would have been. It would have been some club in Atlanta, probably Trackside Tavern, when someone was playing an acoustic show. 
Um, because when I started doing my writing, that was kind of the deal is that the club owners would be like, you can come in, but you can't drink. And, you know, if we catch you even trying, we're never going to let you back in here again. And I was like, I don't care because that's not what I'm here for. So they would take Sharpie, a black Sharpie and make a gigantic X on my hand. Yep. Um, to make sure that I couldn't get a drink. And I never tried. Um, cause I really truly was there cause I wanted to see the music being played live. Um, so even though it wasn't what P- Purple Rain led me to believe it would be, <laughs> I, I still found that I really love seeing music in a live setting more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I love listening to albums at home, but there's nothing like seeing someone do this right in front of me. I still feel that way. Yeah, it was funny. That was, you know, I started playing music live when I was 16 and it was the same thing. I was like, I'm going to have access to seeing these things that I couldn't see. Otherwise, I'd have to stand outside and listen in a parking lot while a band played. And so it was frustrating whenever I wasn't on a show like to stand outside and be like, oh, scratch acid are playing. They sound great, you know, but um Yeah, it was like something really early that I wanted to do, partly because I wanted to be inside and see it. And the same thing, I had to stand behind the uh, soundboard, couldn't move, had to stay there. Oh, they didn't make me do that. Yeah, yeah, they were. (laughs) They let me. They let me roam free. No, they didn't do that here. (laughs) And they weren't smart enough to put an X on a hand or know that one kid. Oh, it took days with rubbing alcohol to get that off too. And I'd go to school (laughs) and my teachers would be like, what is that? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, I looked like I was 11. Like, there's no way they're going to serve me. There's just no way. They're like, oh, yeah, that's that kid and that dumb band. Yeah, dumb. Have you seen Under the Cherry Moon or Graffiti Bridge? The other films. I have, but it's been so long that I barely remember either one, and neither one captured me the way yeah. that Purple Rain did. And I, I think probably most people probably feel that way because the, this film is the one. Purple Rain is the one that's really stood the test of time. Yeah, in its way. I think the pressure to be everything too, as a musician back then, where you're like, I am a movie star. I'm also a songwriter. I'm also a visual artist. I also, you know, have yeah. like Michael Jackson being like, I have Captain EO at Disneyland. Like everybody had to kind of really think on those terms of like, I have to be in every medium. Yeah. And I really can't blame Prince for after this, you know, kind of veering off into some really esoteric stuff. I mean, because yes. where do you go after this? There really is nowhere you can go farther up. Yes. And, you know, he really made it clear that he is a true artist, you know, um, what, even if that meant taking a nosedive commercially. And so in a way I can, I can respect that, you know, he's doing the art as he saw fit and people could come along with him for that or not. Um, now, of course he had the luxury of having made bank on purple rain so that he could do that. You know, a lot of artists have to be a lot more pragmatic than that. You know, like what can I do to keep my career going kind of thing. Um, but I really do respect that he made it clear that he, um, I mean, is a true artist in, in, in the in the genuine sense of that word. And yeah. um, I'm just sorry that he's not still with us. Um, I have friends in Atlanta who were at his final show and they said that it was phenomenal, just like every other show I've heard of him playing. And when I've seen him play, you know, I did see him play once and it was amazing. So I, he's just one of those people who, um, was clearly born to do this and only this. And so I respect that. Yeah. And I, you know, he's 26 and he was already being like, I don't want to do Purple Rain 2. I'm over here now. I'm going to do something completely different with my music. And again, you're right. Come along or not. Um, but yeah, a lot of artists would not do that. They would do Purple Rain 2. Yeah, they do it until it, it was um, a gimmick, basically. Right. <laughs> Yeah, incredible. But yeah, it's such a shame. Because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on him to do this again, because I'm sure the record company and the film companies and all this are just salivating over, like, can we can we do that again? That'd be yeah. great. You know? Yeah. And again, like I said earlier, he didn't speak to the press from the release of 1999 and 83 till the release of Around the World in a Day in 85. In a way, that's clever, though, because it was like the mystique, right? Totally. You know? But like, <laughs> and it worked. Like, he did not have to do interviews for Purple Rain. Like, people, it, it sold so many copies. 
um, 1.5 million copies in its first week alone. That's crazy. And <laughs> just also the competitive streak, you know, um, it, it was just, you know, him and Michael Jackson, Madonna were like, you know, the ones really um, trying to top the charts. But the film was beloved when it came out and got really good reviews. And there was a couple critical ones like Vincent Camby um, of The New York Times said it was probably the flashiest album cover ever to be released as a movie. <laughs> but then like Pauline Kael was like, you know, these songs are amazing and it's a free expression of what made James Dean the idol of young moviegoers. So somebody who was like, yeah, he's an icon already and people are reading into the drama that he's bringing in it. I think as an actor, he's quite, he's pretty subdued in this. You know, I mean, he definitely has energy on the stage and he has violent outbursts, but he's, it's just really interesting to see how like withdrawn he is in it, kind of shy. That gets back to what I was saying before about how it's like, this is not how I would have expected someone would choose to present themselves. You'd think yeah. they'd be all kind of like strutting peacock thing. I'm invincible, not this kind of soft-spoken, vulnerable guy. It's interesting. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on and talking about the film and your work and everything. Do you have something that you're working on next? Um, yeah, right now I am just finishing up uh, a memoir with Eugene Hoots of Gogol Bordello. Um, he is an amazing performer, um, both as a musician and actor. Uh, he was in the film, Everything is Illuminated. And with his band, Gogo Bordello, he pioneered the, the genre of gypsy punk, he calls it. And he's just an amazing guy. He, he came to America as a refugee from Ukraine. So his story is really, really fascinating because, I mean, he literally came here with nothing. He had no money didn't really know English. I mean, nothing. And so to build up, you know, as a 19, 20 year old from literally nothing to what he is today is a really fascinating story. So kind of putting the finishing touches on it now. Amazing. Um, so that, that will come out next year sometime on um, Matt Holt books, which is a division of Ben Bella. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a really different thing than my other book, you know, um, but that's OK. Yeah. What is it like to to concentrate on one story? Uh, easier and harder, you know, like the, the difficulty for the She's a Badass book was, you know, convincing 20 people to do it and tracking him down. And, you know, all the logistics of that was it was a lot. Um, you know, Eugene is just one person. But then that means when he gets busy, you know, we're kind of stuck. So. <laughs> It's it's easier and harder too because right. you you know he's just always on the go but you know um, he's been great to work with and I really appreciate that you know he he's been so open with me about his story which is um, it's it's really fascinating and he's really had to overcome much more than I even realized to get to where he is today so wow. I can't wait so at the end of every episode I ask the same question but I tailor it depending on what we're talking about. So on a scale from one to 20, with one being the lowest and 20 being the highest, how many minutes do you wait for Prince to return to the stage for an encore do you give this film? Do you wait one minute to 20 minutes for this film? Oh, it's Prince. I'd wait the 20. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 20 minute wait film. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't go anywhere. There's a chance he'd come back out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd still be there. Right. Uh, I wish we still had the chance to have him do actual shows and, and have that opportunity still. But yeah, I mean, like this is a film that I'm happy to return to, you know, periodically throughout the years. I know, um, and I, I always come away from it feeling better after I've watched it. You know, yeah. even the parts that kind of rankle me through today's lens, you know, you can kind of say, well, Think of the time in which it was created and, and cut it some slack, or at least I'm able to. Yeah. Um, and so it always makes me happy to revisit it. So I think it's a great piece of art. It's just uh, it's just great to have so much access to Prince as a performer, especially at this time. So I think we're lucky to have it. Agreed. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday on your favorite podcast app, and additional bonus episodes every Sunday on our Patreon. The show's a completely independent affair, 
So the best way to support the show is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash revolutions per movie, where you can get weekly bonus episodes and shows, exclusive limited edition flexi discs and records and CDs featuring guests that have appeared on the show, and other exclusive goods sent to you just for joining. You can follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and also find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.